We are to think together this morning for a little while on Christ's method for carrying forward his work in the world. It is suggested by this text from the fifth chapter of the Acts. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought the apostles forth and said to them, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Text directs our attention to the second persecution of the early church. The progress made by the early church in its witness and work for Christ was one of the miracles of all Christian history. A little company without prestige or prominence or power began to talk about Christ, and in one generation, the pagan empire of Rome was shot through with streams of Christian life. Such success upon the part of the early church called forth the bitterest persecution of the Sadducees. It was a sect in Christ's day, and was very aggressive then, and its successors are with us yet. The Sadducee is a stark materialist. They said, Neither we do not believe in resurrection or angel or spirit. We believe that man came from the mud and is mud and will go back to the mud and be mud forever. A blank, blind, stark material. Now the teaching of the apostles aroused a mighty awakening among the people. And these Sadducees, these materialists sought to stamp out this new religion that was so regnant and stirring among the people. The way of persecution is always a failure. It may seem to succeed, but it does not succeed. The seed of the martyr, the blood of the martyr, is the seed of the church. Truth crushed to earth, will rise again. The eternal years of God are hers, but error, wounded, writhes with pain and dies among its worshippers. Persecution won't win. The mills of the gods grind slowly, but they grind exceeding small. Though with patience he stands waiting, with exactness grinds he all. The persecutions now abroad in the earth against Christianity are foredoomed to defeat just because of God. Satan is not going to dethrone God. To me, the comforting statement day and night these days is this one here from the Bible, the Lord God omnipotent reign. And though clouds and darkness are round about him, yet justice, and judgment are the habitations of God's throne. These early Sadducees, these materialists, sought to blot out Christianity by the strong arm of force of persecution. So they took these apostles and put them all in jail and said, guard these men. Don't let any of them get away. Now they've ended it, haven't they? No, an angel of the Lord came down in the night and opened the prison doors and got all of the apostles out and gave them the charge, go to the temple and speak there to the people all the words of this life. And they did as the angel bade them do. And when the morning came and the inquiry was made, it was found that the prisoners were all out and gone. And to the utter confusion of these Sadducees, they said, whereunto will this grow? 
we are confronted with a marvelous something, and uh, it uh, forebodes uh, distress we fear for us. Whereunto will it grow? And while they were pondering what to do about it, one came saying, we went to the prison and the doors are shut and the keepers are all there on guard, but all the prisoners are out and we've been to the temple and they're there just speaking away for Christ. And then they sent their officers after them and arrested them. And they were arraigned before these officers. And sharp words were said to them by these bullying, overpowering, persecuting men. And Simon Peter and the others simply spoke up for saying, first of all, we ought to obey God rather than men. You told us not to do this, but there's a higher authority told us to do it. We ought to obey God rather than men, and we mean to do so. Then you know the rest. They were beaten and bruised and then turned loose and threatened and warned and charged not to do so anymore, and they went right on with their preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. One of the great pictures out of the New Testament. Now, there are many truths in it. We've time for meditation briefly on three. We have, first of all, Christ's messengers are here indicated. And the method that they are to employ is here marked out. And the message that they are to give is here enough. First of all, the messengers. An angel came and turned these apostles out of the jail and gave them the word going to the temple where the people come in great numbers and speak there to the people all the words of this life. The angel wasn't the preacher. These men were to be the preachers. Angels are not preachers now. They are bright spirits, unfallen, holy, sinless. One wonders, uh, wouldn't an angel make a great preacher? No, he'd be too far away from us. He'd be too far away from us. We must have somebody touched with the feeling of our infirmity. We must have somebody come and tell us, I've been over that road. I've been shamed and stained by sin. I've been mutilated and marred, and my life misshapen and decimated by sin. An angel wouldn't do for your preacher. If you'd want your old preacher back, if you had an angel a while, he'd be so far removed from you. You must have some preacher that knows what it is to fight with temptation and battle and burden, to resist Satan, to overcome. Somebody that can tell you, I've tried, I've been over the road. It isn't a theory, it's a fact, it's a living reality. The angels can't preach. They have a great mission. They're our servants. Angels are our servants. They're sent to be ministering spirits to all who are the heirs of salvation. And maybe one of the wonders we'll have in heaven will be the unfolding, folding wonder of how in 10,000 ways that we never dreamed of, an angel got in between us and danger and lured us away. They're ministering ser servants sent from God to his people in the world. One came and strengthened Jesus when he prayed out of his broken heart in Gethsemane. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him. An angel, maybe, watches over your house every night. There's some praying mother or father or others there. How wonderful, how wonderful the nature and the ministry of angels. But they're not suitable preachers. Jesus needed to become a man in order to redeem man. He couldn't be away off yonder, God. He was manifest in the flesh. He became a man. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin, that he might be a redeemer, a savior. He took our place under the law of God and took all of its lashings, its denunciation, its chastisement, and bore them all in his own body on a cross for us. Angels can't be the preachers. You and I'll have to do, poor as we are. You and I'll have to be the preachers, the witnesses for Christ, poor as we are. But now when you think of it, oh, what honor this is to man, that the Lord would make us his fellow workers. 
workers together with him, that the Lord would make us fellow helpers to his own truth, to his own kingdom. What an honor to man. And how much better it is for a man to do this, as I've said, than for a ministering spirit who never knew what sin was, never tasted its bitter dregs, had no conception of the misery that sin entails and the battle into which it plunges us and by which we are plagued. An angel couldn't do that. It's a work for a deem man. A work for a deem man and women to go out and tell others about Christ. What an honor to man. And what a blow it is to Satan. What a blow it is to Satan. When uh, David came out into the field against that big braggart, Goliath, he said, uh, Art thou this stripling coming to me, this boy? I'll make quick work of him, but you remember he didn't do it. And God means by redeemed men and women to drive every evil agent from the earth in time. What a blow this is to Satan. What humiliation to Satan. What humiliation and what honor it is to God. Long years ago, Edward III, King Edward III, had his boy at the battlefront. The boy was called the Black Prince. He was the battlefront, and the battle was going against him. And they sent word to the father, your boy is in tight, a tight place, a terrible place. You'd better send reinforcements. He said, no, just let him face it. The honor will be all the greater when he wins, all the greater. The glory will be all the greater. Let my boy face it, and face it he did, and win out he did. Oh, what honor it brings to our Lord when we stand for Christ, and having done all, when we stand, when we withstand, when we hold aloft the banner, and do not allow it to trail in the dust, what honor we bring to God. Uh, men and women redeemed by the Lord Christ will have to be the witnesses. Not angels, men and women, just like us. Before us they witnessed, and after us they to witness. Not angels. Oh, what must the angels think of us? What must the angels think of us? If they could talk to us now, what do you suppose they'd say? Don't you suppose they'd say to us, Oh, men and women, why will you spend your lives in vanity and leasing? Why will you wear your minds out and your hearts out on things that perish with the coming and going? Why will you just rave and rage and be overborn with things that are just for today? Why won't you, why don't you put your emphasis continually and supremely on the things of eternal moment? I suppose they'd say that. I have no doubt they'd say that if they were to talk today. But now look at the method. This is a word about the messengers. It's men and women like us, saved by Christ, that must go and tell others. We must tell them in Dallas and Texas and America and in Africa and in Europe and around the globe. We must go and tell others. Redeemed men and women must go, not angels. Now what about the method? The angel came and got these men out of the prison, these soldiers, and said, go to the temple. And there speak to all the people the words of this life. You go to the temple. Go to the temple where the Sadducees gather. Go to the temple where the people gather. Go where the people are. Go where they'll come in great numbers. And there, speak to the people all the words of this life and go at once. It's night, but you go to the temple. You go to the temple without delay, don't loiter. The king's business requires haste. Get you on your mission. Get you on your mission. Go to the temple and speak to the people. Speak to all the people. Speak to all the people. Christ and Christianity know nothing about uh, uh, the demarcation of classes. Nothing of that sort. Christ's gospel is the pioneer of all popular education and of all liberty and of all real abiding progress. Christ's gospel doesn't know anything about classes at all. It doesn't know anything about preaching a gospel to the rich and another gospel to the poor. Not at all. All are needy sinners alike in the sight of God. Don't speak to all the people. Don't speak to all the people. That was a bad day back yonder centuries ago when a line was drawn and on one side they placed the clergy and on the other side they placed the laity. And the clergy functioned and the laity looked on 
and stayed far off, and nothing came of it except the blight, the blight of the Middle Ages. That isn't Christ's plan. If a layman can speak for Christ, then he must. Then he sins if he doesn't. If he's dumb, if he's silent, if he's inactive. The Bible knows nothing about the distinction between clergy and laity. Every man and woman that can witness for Christ must. That's God's plan. And sometimes, many a time, a layman can give a witness uh, fairly incomparable in his place, in his position. He can give a witness for Christ of eternal moment. The Bible is filled with active laymen. Abraham was a layman, and Isaac and Jacob, they were laymen. Caleb and Joshua were laymen. Mordecai was a layman. Nehemiah was a layman. The three Hebrews cast into the fiery furnace were laymen. Philip and uh, Gaius and Stephen were laymen. The Bible is filled with laymen. Oh, the blight, the darkness that settles down upon the land. If laymen and laywomen imagine that they have uh, measured up to the full measure of their duty, their responsibility, when they come to church a little and maybe give a little might and go away and forget all about it in practical life. We're in the world to represent Christ. Now, what about our message? What about our message? These men were arraigned before their enemies, the officers, and threatened and persecuted and beaten. What about their message? Well, the word spoken right at the start is the right thing for Christians to say, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's what say. That's a foundation premise. That's an immovable stone. We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God if it gets us in jail. We ought to obey God if we get a good flogging for it. We ought to obey God rather than men. Oh, that's the word the world needs now. The world's to pieces, it isn't obeying God. The world's in practical chaos, it isn't obeying God. Why, if men minded God, obeyed God, we'd have peace from the river to the ends of the earth. The lust for greed, the lust for place, the lust for power, the lust for preeminence, the lust for position, the lust for self. Everywhere it is the thing that lures and drives men onward, yea, in their downward way. We ought to obey God rather than man. That's the great word, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. And that all men must answer to God. The will of God, the law of God. God's program for humanity. He has one. It's been revealed. Now we ought to obey God rather than man. That's the foundation premise foundation premise. These apostles said, why, we, we've not obeyed you, and we don't expect to obey you. We ought to obey God rather than man. You Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, no angel, no spirit. We found out better. We found out better. Who got us out of jail last night with the doors locked and barred and a guard around it? We are out. Who got us out? We ought to obey God. You men are stupid. You men are blind. You men are stark mad. And whatever your plight or place may be, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's the great word. That's the great word, oh, for men to have a well-defined faith, for a well-defined conviction. And what is that? The will of God is supreme. The will of God is to be followed whatever it costs. The will of God is to be obeyed. If in such obedience, we shall experience obliquy and scorn and contempt and derision. The will of God is to be obeyed. He's sovereign. He's preeminent. Now the will of God in all the realms of life. Wouldn't you love to hear that echoed from one end of this country to the other? Wouldn't you love to hear the will of God pronounced by statesmen, if we have any left? Wouldn't you love to hear the will of God saying everywhere, like George Washington said, if we ignore God, and disregard the precepts of God, the nation is on the downward plunge. The will of God for America. And America, like other nations, is headed straight for perdition if she dares to ignore the will of God. We've got a great heritage. 
We've had a, got a great background. We've had marvelous forebears. But if we ignore the will of God and play fast and loose with morality, with the high standards of truth and integrity and righteousness, we are headed straight for perdition and overwhelming defeat. We ought to obey God rather than man. And then these men, when they were beaten and whipped and charged and threatened, just went right on, and they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. There it is. There's our message made out for Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Our gospel is the gospel of a person. The gospel of a person. We get beyond all organizations and farms and ceremonies and go straight to him. Here's somebody who did something for us of eternal moment in our behalf. And we put our case in his keeping. We trust him. We yield to him. We turn by his help from every evil way and trustfully, submissively, we turn to Christ and choose him and his way. Salvation by him. And these men said, these apostles said, why, he, we've tried him, we've experienced him. He has corroborated his gospel in our lives. We're not preaching to you phantasms. We're preaching to you facts which we've personally tasted and tested and experienced. Now, that's my simple sermon today. Except to ask, won't you make it personal in your lives? Won't you? Why, there are enough men and women in this big place today, this large hall, and then with that company added in, sympathetic, sympathizing, praying men and women, there are enough men and women hearing this simple discourse this morning who, if they would witness and testify and visit and appeal as they can and ought to do for Christ, wonders would follow in the wake of the effort to witness the work put forth by this company. Let's do it. When did you talk to any man about Christ? When did the lawyer, who's a Christian man, talk to his brother lawyer about Christ? Or the physician to his patient, or neighbor, or the merchant to his when? Oh, my soul, think of a Christian living for months and maybe years, or even for days, without getting across to somebody a quiet, serious inquiry about his or her personal relations to the Lord with whom we all have to do. Are you silent on that great matter and left in the world specifically and preeminently to carry out that great matter? Here enough here to do wonders in just a short time if you'll be witnesses for Christ. Do you say we have been laggards? We have loitered on the road. We have waited. We have slept. We have been indifferent. We have been inactive. Oh, with a great resolve in the house of God, say, I'm going to try from this day forward, please God, to be a witness for Christ according to his own word and way and will. Do you say, well, I never came out for him, but down in my heart I've said yes to him, come out for him, you're my friends, if you do, whatsoever I command you. Say, I've hesitated, I've... I've delayed, I've waited, I've postponed. Haven't you waited long enough? And isn't the mercy, isn't the goodness of God a sufficient motive to you to win you today?